So uh, thanks for giving me a chance to talk about this work, and also thanks to the Institute for uh, bringing me here <laughs> now to, for my second year. In, uh, I was here back in 1011, and uh, at that time, I, uh, Tom and I began talking with David Hughes about um, this problem of antibody localization. We got sort of started, and it got we got, it kind of kept bugging us and bugging us, and we working, working, and uh, uh, it took it a, a return visit, <laughs> um, return year, and, uh, but uh, at this point, we've got uh, some results to report, and uh, so that's what I'm here today to talk about. Uh, just a little bit of background. Fortunately, uh, David Hughes spoke uh, here a couple of weeks ago and gave a lot of background about what many body localization is, but let me just give you a brief um, overview, a summary. Uh, I mean, you have, uh, there's an established field of one body localization, ordinary localization for the Schrodinger operator with a random potential. Uh, many, been many results uh, on that, rigorous results going back to Froelich and Spencer in the early 80s. And, um, but then when it comes to uh, understanding interactions between particles and to what extent the localization phenomenon, which is really can be thought of as lack of transport or decay of the eigenfunctions uh, in space, uh, when you get to um, interacting systems, uh, there's many fewer results available. If you consider a, um, a few particles, a handful of particles or multi-particles, I guess you could call that, then there was work of Chuliaski and Suhoff and Eisenman and um, Worsel uh, about, uh, about five years ago or so, uh, where you consider, let's say, five particles uh, interacting with a random potential and with each other. And then, once again, it's possible to show that there's uh, no transport and that the eigenfunctions decay, that these particles tend to sit in these local potentials, um, uh, these local spots defined by the external potential. Um, of course, there's been a, been a lot of physics um, literature on the uh, blossom really in the last five or so years um, on the notion of many body localization and uh, Although, as David explained, the concept goes all the way back to Eisenman's, to um, Anderson's original paper in 58. Uh, but then the, the whole field shifted and wo wo focused primarily on the one body problem. And then uh, Altschuler, Heliner, and Vasco really started to focus a lot on this uh, idea of localization, sort of, so to speak, in Fox space rather than in physical space. And then the last few years, uh, Hughes and his collaborators, Pal and others, have um, done numerics and uh, really um, done uh, uh, investigated this whole phenomenon to considerable, um, uh, really develop it considerably. Uh, but the mathematically, the, there hasn't been too much uh, to report, there was this recent uh, preprint of um, Giscard and et al. on the many body localization, although the, what they needed to do was to take the randomness and jack it up uh, in a system size dependent fashion, I guess exponentially in the system size. So it kind of turns the many body, this large two to the n dimensional space into um, effectively a low dimensional system when you jack up the randomness that high. So that what we're trying to do, this is joint work with uh, Tom Spencer, is to look at an actual interacting many body problem uh, and to see what we can actually prove on that system without uh, trying to simplify it by means of tuning up the, uh, by say working in a finite box or tuning up the randomness or in some, some system size dependent fashion. I'd love to be able to report 
that we've solved the problem completely, but unfortunately I can't. Uh, what we can do is uh, prove you have many body localization phenomenon occurs, provided you have an assumption, which I would call limited level attraction, which has to do with the statistics of energy levels in a finite system. Um, and so um, basically, we, we, uh, if the energy levels get too clumped together, um, that's going to cause problems for our method. And so we have to make an assumption that that doesn't happen. Hopefully, further work um, will enable uh, us or others to weaken that assumption or to eliminate it altogether. Uh, but that's, that's where we are at the moment. Um, so um, let me, um, oh, <coughs> so now I do, do also want to say I'm going to be working on a spin chain rather than a one-dimensional spin chain rather than on a problem of uh, sort of traditional particles interacting and moving around in space. They're not really that different, but most of the physics work in the last few years has been done on spin chains. And so I'm going to focus on that. This, this, uh, this model actually was um, suggested to us as a good one to work on by David uh, three and a half years ago. So uh, we're going to take this Hamiltonian, um, and it's going to begin with the diagonal part of the Hamiltonian. We have magnetic field, spin operators, And then we're going to have um, nearest neighbor coupling. Like so. And then we're going to have the off diagonal piece, which takes the spin operator x like this. Uh, so these operators um, are the usual ones. Um, like so. Uh, and then, of course, tensored with the identity in the other variables. So this is a, um, operates on a Hilbert space, which is the tensor product of C2 over I in the box lambda. So lambda is going to be a subset of Z of size n. Well, like I said, this part here, if we, we're thinking of the standard basis here, which is the basis in which I wrote these spin operators. Um, so we think of spin up, spin down. Then these two terms here are diagonal. So if it weren't for this, this is kind of a Laplacian term here, which is inducing transitions. Uh, it takes spin up and turns it into spin down. So th there's kind of an analogy which we uh, between this uh, problem and the ordinary one-body problem. Maybe I'll put that over here. In fact, we, in order to develop uh, this problem, we need to develop a new procedure for the one-body problem. We worked that out as a test case, and then. Um, um, moved it over, moved all the techniques over to the many-body problem. So in the, in the one-body problem, you have uh, um, the elementary, you have, let's say, on a lattice like this, and you have um, the diagonal part is just vi, and then you have an off-diagonal part, which is inducing transitions. So here's your matrix. So v1, let's say, v2, v3, and then you have some off-diagonal matrix elements here, which induce transitions, and you can be thought of as inducing random walks uh, 
in the lattice. So the Laplace unit is what's introducing the transitions. Over here, uh, the transition, the analogous transitions are spin flips. So they produce a kind of a random walk in the space of spin configuration. Okay, so um, I guess now these are going to be random variables. So um, we're going to assume that Hi, Ji, and Gamma I are random. So we're going to have bounded density. Um, and they should be bounded as well. And uh, we're basically perturbing in this. This is our small parameter here. So we're going to assume that gamma i is less than some gamma. And it's going to be small. So you can think of this as either you have weak, um, if you have weak uh, hopping, or you can say you have large randomness. Either way, it's equivalent point of view. Now, one thing that's useful to uh, point out is that you have um, these spin operators, but there's also underlying these uh, these things are the classical spin configurations. which I'm going to use the letter sigma for, sigma i, or sigma. And so sigma i equals plus or minus 1 for i and lambda. And these basically label uh, basis vectors. So I'm going to be, I'll say that, you know, I'll talk about energy of a spin configuration. But what I'm really saying is that if I evaluate this Hamiltonian, on the basis vectors, I look at the diagonal portion, I look at the diagonal entry of the Hamiltonian, I'm going to get, so E of sigma is just going to be the summation of Hi sigma i plus Ji sigma i sigma i plus 1. And ignore the off diagonal piece. All right. So the um, so the question is: To what extent does this basis uh, form an accurate representation of the actual eigenstates of the system once you turn on the interaction? That's the basic question among many body localization. Do the true eigenstates resemble the gamma equals zero eigenstates, which are basically just these basis vectors? Now over here on, on the one body problem, that's exactly what you can prove. Um, when you have localization, let's say you have weak, um, you have a weak off diagonal pieces here, J. Uh, then these random walks here are very suppressed with respect to their length because they have the power of J to the length. And um, modulo a lot of <laughs> heavy analysis, you can show that they um, you have exponential decay, and that the, all the eigenfunctions are basically localized about ind individual sites with exponential decay in all directions. So what this means is that you can effectively label all the eigenstates in this one-body problem by sites of the lattice. Of course, there's going to be places where locally there'll be some uh, locally ex extended state, and the eigenstate will be spread out over some localized region. Um, <coughs> so you, um, of course, then there's going to be lots of sites in here. It's not exactly clear how to associate sites to states in that case. 
but you can make up some, some rule. And the point is that this ambiguity is a localized ambiguity. And so in some rough sense, then, you can make a one-to-one -one correspondence between eigenstates and sites in the, of the lattice. And we're going to do this uh, uh, exact same type of correspondence in the many body case. Again, we're going to have these regions where the correspondence gets blurred. But since they're going to be rare regions, um, by and large, we're going to have uh, a clean mapping between eigenstates and basis vectors. So um, I need to mention now this issue of limit level attraction. I'll call it LLA, limited level attraction, parameterized by some number of nu and a constant c. Uh, so we'll con consider H in a box of size n. Uh, the eigenvalues satisfy that the probability, the min of over alpha different from beta, E alpha minus E beta, is less than delta, is less than delta to the nu times c to the n. Um. And this is obviously for, I should have said this for, for any delta bigger zero. So th uh, this is a reasonable assumption to make. Why is that? If you had nu equals to 1, that would be a case of Poisson statistics. Uh, that is, they neither repel nor attract. Um, most of the, you know, the random matrix ensembles are going to actually have nu bigger than 1. That corresponds to level repulsion. So the GOE uh, is going to produce level repulsion. So w we can uh, allow nu, we just need nu to be positive. It doesn't have to be, um, but it has to be, uh, it can't be N dependent. That's the real crux of the matter. If you were, uh, if you were going to try to prove this, uh, you might get somewhere with an independent new. Yes. So there, in a, in a box of size n, there are two to the n eigenstates. Yeah. Yeah. So there, if you want to talk about pairs, maybe there's four to the n pairs. Um, You want to put it in here. Yeah. yeah, but you can just uh, rescale delta and put it over there. You just go delta goes to delta over c to the n. So since we're assuming this for every delta bigger than 0, it doesn't matter where I put the c to the n. Right. So. This is, this is an assumption depending upon a nu and a c. If this is satisfied for a given nu and a given c, then we can let gamma be sufficiently small and we can prove lo many body localization. Yes. Right. 
Now, yeah, like you said, most likely this CVM is going to have to be reflecting the fact that we're taking a minimum over a large number uh, 2 to the n eigenstates here. So that's keep, so obviously the CVM is going to have to be at least 2 to the n or maybe 4 to the n or something like that. But however you can go about, um, this is an assumption that you have to make. Uh, uh, once you've got that, then the rest of the machinery is going to go through. Okay, so you're welcome to your <laughs> your preference, but I think you'll admit that you'll agree that they are an equivalent way to present the assumption. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so um, so then the theorem is uh, if you assume limited level attraction mu c, then if anybody localization holds for gamma sufficiently small. Okay. Well, I've sort of, <laughs> I've begged the question here is what exactly is an anybody localization, but um, as some, uh, our children, I guess, like to say it's complicated. <laughs> um, but uh, let me try to lay out what it is we actually prove. First of all, uh, there's a labeling system for eigenstates. by what I'll call spin, metaspin configurations. As I was alluding to over here in the case of the one body problem, uh, the eigenstates can be associated with um, sites of the lattice, <coughs> except for these dilute regions where there's some ambiguity and there's going to be a what I'm going to say is that these regions of ambiguity, uh, if, they are c if they cover n sites in the lattice, there's going to be 2 to the n eigenstates associated with this region. So in effect, you've got a metaspin, which instead of having two values, plus or minus, it has 2 to the n values, or 2 to the k values, if this is a box here of size k. So then, um, of course, there's a one-to-one -one mapping. You could just as well say there's a spin configuration here, and we're using that to label. But I <coughs> use this meta-spin language just to um, emphasize that uh, I, don't, I don't try to pretend that there's any unique way of associating eigenstates to spin configurations in these resonance blocks. Um, there's uh, what they <coughs> in both in a certain sense. You, you're going to have these blocks um, formed by resonances, but then there's sort of proximity links that you need to add so that nearby blocks of resonances have to be joined up. Uh, that's a bit of a te technical issue. Um, which maybe I'll, if I have time, I'll mention at the end. So yes, they can be, uh, they can have holes. But in a certain sense, uh, the core blocks are these solid intervals. Um, 
By the way, these, um, this labeling system can be thought of the, as this extensive set of uh, conserved quantities local see once if I have this labeling system then um, I can obviously define an operator uh, which gives the value of the spin metaspin configuration in that eigenstate and then when you return to the original basis that operator becomes a somewhat non-local but it remains a conserved quantity because obviously the eigenstate is uh, independent of time. So this is the point of view that uh, the language that David used in his lecture a couple of weeks ago. <coughs> All right, so this labeling system wouldn't do us much good if we didn't have some quantitative control going on. So we have to have bounds on probabilities of resonant blocks to starters. Um, so there's faster than power law decay um, with the diameter of the box. Um, then we have a diagonalization, complete diagonalization of the Hamiltonian. Via a sequence of, of uh, local rotations. Defined via convergent uh, graphical expansions. So these graphical expansions are similar to the ones here that I alluded to, this random walk expansion that you would give for uh, diagonal plus Laplacian, except now they're taking place in um, spin configuration space. Uh, I'll say some more about those in a bit. Um, if you want to talk about expectations of local observables, uh, so in any eigenstate, um, they're close to They're naive values. Uh, which are given by the labeling spin configuration. Or spin meta spin configuration. So for example, uh, if you take the expectation, you want to perform an average over all the eigenstates, and then you would say, take the spin operator at the origin, the Z component in the eigenstate alpha, 
<coughs> the naive value would be given by um, the value of that spin operator in the basis vector corresponding to the eigenstate alpha, which would have to be either plus one or minus one. So its absolute value is one. So this is going to be equal to one plus something, some power of gamma. <laughs> yeah. Well, I put an O here. <laughs> uh, this averaging here, um, <coughs> it's not too critical what type of averaging. Um, average over alpha could be uniform, average over all the eigenstates. So that would correspond to t equals infinity. Or it could be e to the minus beta, e alpha. Or it could be an energy window. Um, it doesn't too much matter how you average it because basically we're working on this problem eigenstate by eigenstate. You, the only problem is if you're trying to do something under the expectation sign, you have to put something here that sort of makes sense. <laughs> okay, so, so once we get to this point here, number four, then we're really starting to see that uh, the notion that this labeling system for the eigenstates really do mean something, that they really do, ref just as over here in the one body problem, if you say the eigenstate is localized about this side of the lattice, it really is localized about that side of the lattice. The labeling system reflects that. Um, yeah, I mean, I could have, um, Cause, you know, you're not really there showing the view of the naive. Yeah, okay, yeah. Maybe I just, the sure, yeah, no, you could prove it this way. I just, um, tried to do it simple. Okay, so you could do something where it's just sigma. Uh, let me put here, instead of alpha, let me write, call it sigma. sigma and then just sigma zero. Sigma zero. Okay. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, then there's an issue of uh, volume convergence. Of, uh, so Local energy differences uh, E alpha minus E beta uh, expectation um, and um, expectations of locals. as lambda goes to infinity. Um, and so this is, uh, by the way, this is, um, and the, the rotations as well. Um, this is Im important in order for us to uh, make the connection between the assumption we made about these level spacings. Uh, 
you have to sort of shift the, vol the volumes around if you're going to take an assumption about level spacings in this small box and compare it to another small box in order to run our procedure. But it's, uh, it's an imp in interesting result, in it, which hasn't really been looked at, I think, even in the one body case, this notion of that the eigenstates converge um, as the box goes to infinity. Yeah, right. Um, and we have expo decay of truncated correlations. So you would take, uh, well, let me write it here, O, X, O, Y, in the eigenstate alpha, less than or equal to gamma to the some power P times X minus Y with probability one minus gamma to some power Q times the log X minus Y squared. So again, again faster than power law decay in probability, not exponential decay in probability, but we do have exponential decay. So of course what this means is if you go to large enough distance, you eventually will get, with probability one, you will eventually get exponential decay. For, for all the eigen, for all the eigenstates, yeah. It's just that the probabilities you couldn't prove they converged exponentially. Yeah, computer. right. So, but you could do this with these very large numerical scales, right? Yeah, it does. It does decay. That's why you have this different probability here. Um, uh, I mean, the best way to think about it is uh, if you have these bad regions which of course you're very familiar with because you, <laughs> you and Tom were throwing these around 30 years ago. Um, um, and if you consider your X and your Y and they don't happen to lie in one of these bad regions, you're going to get exponential decay. But if one of them lies in or if they both lie in a bad region, then you're going to fail to have exponential decay. Um, but as I said, once you, if you allow yourself the freedom to move X and Y farther and farther apart, eventually, because of the diluteness of these regions, eventually you get to a regime where you will have exponential decay. And so in that sense, you have almost sure exponential decay. Uh, 
Um, so really what we're saying here, this is a, uh, basically expo decay of entanglement, which is in, in some, uh, really what many by localization is all about. Um, so, so somehow when you, a lot of the work on They're just in this sense. In this sense, yeah. yeah. But you don't, you don't, you agree that this is a, a measure of entanglement? Informally, I just wonder how precise. Yeah. Work. Yeah. Because the entanglement is in some sense that you have a time bipartite entanglement. Yeah. Okay. And you can do better than that, but anyway. Well, but uh, but you. What we're saying is that the that this measure of entanglement gets extremely small the greater the distance. Much better. Um, and uh, basically, as a corollary of this, you would have uh, uh, faster than power law decay of average uh, truncated correlations. So you take the expectation, the average, and O alpha, O X, O Y in alpha, and this is going to be small in gamma to some Q log X minus Y squared. So it's dominated by these, um, so to speak, uh, these rare events the probabilities of these rare events. Just some just a number bigger than zero. All right, so uh, by the way, I, you know, th so this uh, lack of uh, limited level attraction, I don't think that I couldn't come across ex any examples of systems that really w are supposed to exhibit level attraction. So, um, although, you know, um, the thing is, um, really most of the time levels repel. <laughs> so you have, if you take a two level system and you turn on interaction, this happens, right? Um, the problem is that there's no real general result about this. This sort of should always happen on a statistical basis. You can certainly cup up examples where you have levels where, let's say, these guys are repelling, uh, but these guys are weakly interacting, so this repulsion overwhelms the repulsion that might exist between these levels. And so these, these guys could be pushed together simply because their neighboring levels are pushed apart more strongly. Questions? Um, well, you could try to, uh, we haven't really investigated that. You can look at the Kubo formula, for example. Uh, but in a, in a loose sense, you have a situation where these eigenstates obviously are going to live for all time. And since they, the eigenstates manifestly by the properties that I've given above here, uh, you can specify that they have a non-uniform energy distribution based upon the labeling system. And since those, um, that non-uniform energy distribution then uh, has to persist for all time, uh, you have a lack of transport. So it, in some sense, this uh, notion of transport is coupled with the idea of whether or not the eigenstates are sort of uniformly spread throughout configuration space, or whether, as I've indicated here, they are basically focused on a very narrow um, portion of the Hilbert space. 
And uh, so transport is, uh, in order to get transport, you're going to have to have some kind of thermalization or at least weak thermalization where the eigenstates spread more broadly throughout um, the set of basis states. All right, um, so I would like to <coughs> talk a little bit about the method. Um, so the idea is to, um, as, as it was stated above, you want to find local unitary rotations. Um, so it's a necessarily an iterative scheme, KAM or RG type scheme. So it's based on perturbation theory in non-resident regions. And block rotations in resonant regions. So it's kind of, it could also be thought of as a block Jacobi method. In, in Jacobi method for diagonalizing a matrix, uh, you sort of look for the um, largest off diagonal terms and you diagonalize the two by two, uh, you divide, you di diagonalize that two by two matrix exactly. Well. If you have a, we have a large resonant block, we're going to devise, diagonalize that whole resonant block exactly. Um, and that way we get rid of all those bad off diagonal terms. Um, and uh, so in that sense, we're using a kind of a Jacobi scheme. So in general, um, how does this work? If you have any Hamiltonian, which is given by a diagonal plus an off-diagonal piece, then you can write an anti-symmetric matrix Aij equals Jij over Ei minus Ej. And use that to generate a rotation. H1 then is going to be equal to e to the minus a h e to the a. These would be the diagonal elements. So h0 of h0. Um, What'd you say? <laughs> right. So we're doing an iterative scheme. I don't expect to completely diagonalize it the first step. Uh, so I basically take something that will give me the right answer to first order and perturbation theory, and then that will produce uh, a new Hamiltonian where the off-diagonal terms are um, of order gamma squared instead of of order gamma. We can write a nice expression for this as commutators of this matrix A with H. And uh, since you have the property that A, you commute A with H0, you get minus J. That's 
pretty much why, how it was constructed. If you commute A with H0, um, for one term, you're going to get the E i on the right, and the other term, you're going to get Ej on the left, and they'll cancel that denominator and produce a minus J. And as a result, you can get the following expression. You get H0 plus the sum and e now n equals 1 to infinity because n equals 0 term just cancels of 1 over n factorial minus 1 over n minus 1 and plus 1 factorial add a to the n applied to j. Uh, so we can write this as h0 plus j1. So note, uh, so we're assuming that j is O of gamma, which means A is also O of gamma, provided this energy denominator isn't too small. If n equals 1, the le leading term is going to be basically the commutator of A with j, which is order of gamma squared. Now the beauty of this is that um, uh, although it produces a lot of terms, uh, they're all, it produces this graphical expansion which I've been referring to. If you repeat, you see, um, this process again, of course in order to get back to where you started, you're going to have to take um, a diagonal piece and put that here. At least the lower order parts of the diagonal, you're going to have to put back here to get a new diagonal piece. So we'll call it H01 plus J1. And now this is off diagonal. Now you can repeat. And then the next time it's going to be of order gamma to the fourth and then gamma to the eighth. So you get this rapid convergence of the procedure, similar to the KAM. Yeah, right. So that, that J1 will contain a few large terms? No, so um, I've been ignoring those for the, for right at the <laughs> moment, but let's say you have some resonant region, places where EI minus EA, EJ are small. Then you perform these rotations in the intervening areas. No, the, the, see, this is a local energy difference. This is an energy difference which is produced by an operation of an off-diagonal term. So off, all off-diagonal terms are, at this point, are just simple spin flips. Okay, so you're saying the Aij that exists is flipping one spin and so the energy difference. Yeah. So, um, so we do these perturbative rotations um, in between, and then over here we do a block rotation. Just uh, we don't really know much about it. We just know there is a matrix which will diagonalize this portion of the Hamiltonian. Right, yeah. Right. But if, if, you, if you want to see all the formulas out in their full detail, you should read our paper. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. <coughs> Yeah, right. Right, yeah. It was a, it was a good question because it allowed me to reinforce that very important point. In fact, you have 
this whole notion of locality has to be preserved. Uh, so what happens actually when, when, you can, when you take this commutator, this J is going to be a single spin flip. Um, so let me just put an index I because this place where the spin flip occurs. And likewise, A is going to have um, an I. Um, if, it, if you take that J of I and divide by the energy difference, as in that formula up there. So if you look at the commutator, A of I with J of J, let's say, this is zero if I minus J is bigger than one, at least in the first step. <coughs> now, you do have this term in the, in the Hamiltonian, um, SD I, SD I plus one, which means the energies are going to be sigma I, sigma I plus one. So the energy change that's induced by a single spin flip will depend upon what's going on a neighboring spin. And so that means this commutator uh, will be non-zero also for neighboring I and J. But beyond that, it's going to be zero. And um, we're only really going to need to worry about these um, <coughs> connected diagrams. If you apply this expansion, what happens? You, um, Yeah. So we can, I'll just draw a dot for a site, and then another dot, this one failed to commute with that one. So this, let's say this is an A and this is a J. And then another one, that failed to commute, it was the nearest neighbor. But then over here, you may have another couple of neighboring sites. And over here, so you, you have this idea that there's things sort of going on independently in different regions of space-time. But at any given moment, you're only concerned with the connected diagrams, which consist of, at most, nearest neighbor links. Now, what can also happen is you can get another flip. You can keep flipping some of these interior sites. So it's not, strictly speaking, a random walk anymore. But, so to speak, the most important terms are the ones that do actually produce um, a random walk in one dimension. <coughs> 